first character, uh, basically where the whole Spoony thing came from, uh, I, I, okay, here's how we started, was I really wanted to make a bard character. For some reason I was looking through the old player's handbook and I, I just liked the idea of a bard, because he could kind of do everything, you know, he's a, he's a fighter, a mage, and a thief without actually having to be the fighter, mage, thief class. So, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, I was like, that's kind of cool. So, I was like, um, I wanted to come up with a name that was uh, something the something, because all the best characters like Eric the Red, or, you know, Robert the Bruce, you know, that, he wasn't a character, he was an actual story, you know what I mean, though. Um, I wanted something or some, uh, something of something or something from something, you know, I wanted to, something very descriptive. So, to where, because ma mainly I wanted my guy to have, like, a reputation. So, like, it, it was very kind of an early proto-Jack Sparrow, long before there was a Jack Sparrow, where he's, you know, somebody would bring up his name and he'd be like, oh, this guy, you know, because he's known for being this. Something, something outlandish I could introduce myself as, to where the, it would speak of great deeds or some kind of ego. I wanted my guy to be very boastful. So that's, that's what I came up with, and so... This, and also, I wanted what I wanted to do was make the make the adjective that I tacked on the end of his name be something that nobody knew what it was, like something like you know, tandem the ostentatious, you know, not, not 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 that word, but something something descriptive or very obscure that nobody knows what the fuck the word means. So I was trying to find a word like that, and so um, eventually I was playing Final Fantasy II uh, on the SNES. And that's where that there's a scene in there where the old sage is beating up the bard. Because I started thinking, I was like, oh, there's a bard in that. So I, I, originally his name was going to be Edward. I'm like, nah, it's too obvious. I don't want to be Edward. So I came up with just Tandem. That was his name. I don't know why. It was just, whatever. And then at that point he goes, you spoony bard. And I'm like, oh, a spoony. That's, no, I don't know what, I don't know what that word means. So when somebody, you know, my guy was Tandem the spoony. And that was how he would introduce himself to everyone, and everyone would be like, what does that mean? And I'd go, oh, it's Elvis, you wouldn't understand. So that was the whole thing where, you know, Spoonie, Spoonie does have a meaning if you look it up, and actually it's very fitting for the character the way he turned out, but yeah, that's where that comes from. And so that was, that was always the, the nom de plume, or nom de deeds, or whatever you want to call it, of, of him was he was the Spoonie guy. So, and it was also very easy to remember because there's a very bad habit in a lot of role-playing groups where nobody learns the characters' names to the point where people are just kind of defined by their job or worse, their race. So, like, more, you'll see this happen so many times in an RPG where you'll get into a fight and you hear the guy go, Elf, shoot that guy with your arrow. And the elf is like, my name is fucking Moonbeam, you know. Or they'll be like the dwarven thief, or they'll be like dwarf, or worse yet, thief. Like, thief, go disarm that trap. And the guy's like, I have a name, you know. And, for, and Second of all, you don't know my character's a thief. Because not every thief, like, advertises that they're a thief. They just kind of pose off as being mercenaries. So, like, whenever I would play a thief, I would always correct people. It's like, how do you know I'm a thief? You've never actually seen me steal anything. Because I, whenever I would steal shit, I wouldn't announce to the other guys, like, hey, guess what? I stole this shit, you know. I was always very subtle about it. I just pretended to be a fighter. Or, a, you know, a very skilled fighter. They... Yeah, I, I always said, like, oh, I know, I can, I, I'm keen-eyed, I can see traps, and it's like, I'm a hunter, you know, whatever. They knew I was a thief, but they, I didn't want them to yell, like, loudly, hey, thief, go check that out. Like, fucking hell, man, you know. So you hear that a lot, where people call the elf the elf. Um, I always learn other characters' names, that's just the thing I do. I don't want to be that guy who is always, like, dwarf, go fight that thing. Um, so, I played, uh... Tandem the Spoonie is, was, was a bard, and he was my longest-running character. Um, to the point where I think everyone kind of has a character like this, especially old back in the old days, where they played that character, and if you were lucky enough to get to higher level, you kind of got very protective of that guy, and you kind of, um, you know, there was a lot of stories tied into this guy, and he was actually one of those characters where I leveled him up to 20, I got to the highest level you can be, and then went further, to the point where at level 20 your characters can ascend into being gods. And that's what my character did, was he became a demigod. He actually became a demigod uh, under the uh, under the god, I think, of Travelers and... Uh, the, yeah, I think it's the god of Travelers. Heward is his name. And so my guy became Heward's apprentice, 
And because Hewitt eventually wanted to go wandering off into other dimensions, and he wanted Tandem the, to, be the, to be the god of wanderers in this dimension. Which was kind of cool, like, you know, we were playing kind of godly adventures, and my, it, you know, there was some galactic threats we were facing. It was fun. I mean, there was actually stuff beyond level 20 you could do in AD&D. This was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons before 3rd edition. So there was a lot to do, and we were running all this stuff. And um, it got to the point where the group, the, you know, the group kind of moved on, and I still wanted to play my character. But the problem is, the, the, the other group the guy was running was a level was level 15 or something like that. He was he 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 had been running two campaigns for a very long time. I played Tandem the Spoonie for 3 4 years before this. And so I'm like, well, so they're level 15, right? And he goes, yeah. So I go, well, we could still work this out in terms of storyline. Besides that, you know my character's not really having a good time being a god. You know, it seems like it seemed like a good idea to Spoonie at the time to well, of course, be a god. That sounds awesome. You wave your hand and things happen. And so, problem is he got really bored because when you're a god, you have various responsibilities and you have to, like, listen to prayers and there's all sorts of adulation and stuff like that. And people are praising you and it sounds great, but all of a sudden everyone's very... There's a lot, of, there's a lot you gotta do when you're a god. And so my guy wasn't really digging the responsibility of it. He was, you know, ironically, he was becoming the god of wanderers who had to work at the office. And so... I'm like, what about this? And so, I'm like, can you think of a way that my character would uh, be demoted in some way? And he's like, I can think of something like that. So, um, we ran an adventure where uh, my guy was, <laughs> my guy got caught, uh, I forget the goddess's name. It wasn't Aphrodite. It was like, uh, <laughs> it was like one of Zeus's daughters. I got caught porking one of Zeus's daughters, and my reaction, they goes, okay, you, you, you visit Mount Olympus because you've never been there. You go to, it's called Bytopia, I think Mount Olympus is on Bytopia. So I'm like, well, you, I, your character, your character goes to Bytopia, and he goes to scale Mount Olympus because he's never seen the gods of the, of the Greek pantheon. You've heard all sorts of stuff, so you go drinking with... You know, you, you go drinking with all these gods, you, you visit the Nord, you visit Valhalla, and you drink with Thor, and you have a great time fighting, fighting in Valhalla, and you get really wicked hammered there, and then you go to Mount Olympus. And, of course, my character is quite the ladies' man. Uh, over the course of the adventure, my character eventually wound up with 20 charisma, because he started out with a natural 19, and he got, somehow, I think he, uh, because when you become a god, your natural stats go up. And so my character had like a 20 charisma, so he was really fucking good looking. And he was very charismatic as well. He was boastful, but he was a swashbuckler. This is what he did. And so, um, I, God, why can't I remember this goddess's name? It was one of, okay, one of Zeus's daughters. So Zeus walks in on me porking one of his daughters, and he physically threw me off Olympus so hard that I landed on my head, and he officially cast me out of Olympus for, for now and forever. And even the other gods were kind of shaking their heads. And my reaction when Zeus walked in was like, What? <laughs> was, he didn't take kindly to that at all. So, yeah, he, he, he physically hurled my fucking ass off Olympus. And I, there was associated level loss because Zeus gave me the beating of a lifetime. And even Heward had to kind of shake his head and be like, You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you, uh, yeah. You pissed off the father of gods, and um, I'm like, what? She was, she came on to me, and he's like, I. <laughs> he's like, you might have to, you're probably gonna have to walk the earth as a mortal for, uh, for, forever. And I go, you know what? That's fine. I quit. And so my character was officially mortal, and he was like level 14, and it was, it was, it was. It was probably way funnier than at the time because the group was really having a good laugh as they as they saw Thor fucking kick my ass. I actually fought the guy and it lasted one round. He jammed a thunderbolt up my ass. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I lost initiative and he jammed a thunderbolt up my ass. So he didn't kill me, but he threw me off Olympus. So. This is the story of the last ride of Tandem the Spoonie, of my re official retirement of the Spoonie Bard. Um, 
so we, you know, I was adventuring with these guys for quite a while. This is where I met, this is where I met Crazy Mike, and I was always sitting next to Crazy Mike. And eventually, um, we're playing this game, and the DM comes to us, and I'm, my character's level 18 by this point. Um, you know, I'm kind of getting back to that point where I might actually have to go talk to Thor and apologize again. <laughs> but, you know, I'm getting up to level 18, and... Uh, the DM says, hey, look, guys, you guys have been having a great time. You, you guys have been great, but um, I want to run an older adventure, some one of the classics. And have you guys ever played Dungeon Land or The Land Beyond the Magic Mirror? And we go, no. And they, have you read it? And we go, no. That's one, of the, that's one of Gygax's adventures, right? He goes, yeah, right, right. So if you remember what I said about uh, the RPGA coddling its players and not wanting to kill people, back in the day... Back in the advanced Dungeons and Dragons and the old school days, it wasn't that way at all. They actually had competitions where DMs would run tables of players through the hardest fucking adventures they could find. They were called tournament modules. And they were meant, they were designed to be character meat grinders. That's where like Tomb of Horrors comes in. Tomb of Horrors, you would, you would, those were the kind of adventures where you had to have like a stack of character sheets to where when you died, you just rolled up a new guy like on the spot um, and that that was they were death traps almost all those all those adventures were death traps and I know you know Gary Gygax is a saint of Dungeons and Dragons but I've read a lot of his modules they are fucking insane that guy honestly did not write very good adventure modules I know it's sacrilege to say that but um, prime example of this is Castle Greyhawk probably one of the worst adventures I've ever read um, and th what kills me is I don't know what its intention was, what the, what the point behind Castle Greyhawk was. Because it is one of the most fucking insane meat grinders characters will ever go, th ever go through. I have no idea how anyone plays that campaign. I have no idea how anyone um, ever survives Castle Greyhawk. And this is the story. It's, um, there's a castle in Greyhawk called Castle Greyhawk. And living in it is, I believe it's the wizard Mordenkainen. I think it's I think it's Mordenkainen. I, I don't think it's Big B. It's probably Mordenkainen. And the story of this is Mordenkainen is a powerful, powerful archmage. He's one of the he's one of the greatest uh, archmages in the world of Greyhawk. And he's so powerful, in fact, he doesn't actually spend all that much time on Greyhawk because he's unlocked the power of dimensional travel. And he visit because of this, he has regularly visited Earth, our Earth where he's become very successful and wealthy as a movie producer. Because he can also bring monsters and adventurers and magic, and he makes movies using adventurers and magic and monsters from Greyhawk. And he just basically retells epic stories in terms of movies by bringing actual characters in, and they're like, oh, he has the best special... I'm not even kidding. This is what, this is what it is. And so... He also does, what he does is, he shoots movies in his castle of Castle Greyhawk. And then he brings them back to Earth. So, basically when you get into Castle Greyhawk, it's really fucking dangerous, but it's also a movie studio. And this is where I don't know if it's meant to be a comedy, or, well, it's probably meant to be a comedy, because there's no way you can take this shit seriously. Um, we didn't play Castle Greyhawk, but I read it. And... I remember, I distinctly remember, um, there's a few times where um, you will actually meet the cast of Star Trek in Castle Greyhawk and fight them, potentially, and they have, you know, phasers and shit. Um, also, when you get to the lowest level of Castle Greyhawk, you, um, there's random encounters that occur because you start going into the dressing rooms for the various actors in Mordenkainen's movies. And one of the random encounters is Thor. So, you'll... And it actually specifically says, you walk in on Thor's dressing room, and he's very upset to see you, and he attacks immediately. So you have to fight fucking Thor in Castle Greyhawk. I, I couldn't even fucking believe it. I was reading this adventure module, and it's like, oh, you see... Uh, a Bulat and some monster, a Mind Flayer... Thor! So, yeah. Uh, you know, like a Beholder and a Thor! I'm like, oh, okay, Thor. What the fuck is Thor doing here? What are the fucking cast of... You're like, he beat up fucking Shatner. 
in Castle Greyhawk. I, I, I didn't get it. So, this is before I knew this. But I knew that uh, Dungeon Land and Land Beyond the Magic Mirror are considered, widely considered to be classic dungeon crawl modules. And so, he's like, what do you say for our last adventure, we run through Dungeon Land? And we're like, right on. Our characters were kind of reaching retirement age anyway, and I was honestly pretty sick of playing Tandem the Spoonie anyway. I, sh I probably shouldn't have had him demoted. It was a funny story, but I probably should have just let him kind of be on, be a, be a demigod and kind of assume his place as the god of travelers. You know, it was a good way to set him off, but... Um, I was like, okay, well, this is a good retirement thing. We can we can go through this, and so I'm expecting this really classic module. And here's what Dungeon Land is. I knew this much, but here's what it is. It's your it's it's Dungeons and Dragons characters going through Alice in Wonderland. That's that's exactly what it is. It's it's not even an attempt. To, it's not a ripoff. It's just what if your D and D characters went to Wonderland and fucked around there for a while. But here's the problem. It's one of Gygax's modules, I think, I'm, I'm almost certain it is, but it is an absolute nightmare. It's like the most dangerous fucking place I've ever seen in any Dungeons & Dragons. I've, my character's been to hell and fought his way out of hell, and Dungeon Land was worse. Fucking everything wants you dead in Dungeon Land, in Wonderland, or whatever you want to call it. Let's just call it Wonderland. Fucking everything wanted us dead. Fucking everything was attacking us constantly. There was not a nice person in the entirety of Wonderland. And I know, you know, like, you, I grew up watching the fucking Disney movie. And then there's like, oh, there's whimsical characters, but they didn't fucking try to kill us. So, prime example of this. We're wandering around, and one of our first, um, our first encounter is, like, the caterpillar who smokes the hookah. And he's on, this, he's on this big flower, and he's reclining, and he's talking to us. And he's smoking his hookah, and he's, he's just talking to us. Like, weird stuff. He's like, so... And he's really, he's really stoned, because so, so the DM's talking, he's like, so how are you guys finding this place? Is it cool? And we're like, we're like it's interesting. We've encountered some dangerous things. He's like, oh, don't worry about that, man. It's just because you're different, man. All you gotta do is just kinda go with it, dude. And we're like, what do you mean? And he's like, if you just take the time to relax and chill out and just learn to take life easy, things won't seem to bother you all that much. And that's the key, man. I've been here for thousands of years, smoking my hookah, and I'm happy as can be, and everything is good. Why don't you join me? And right now I'm starting to think things are up. Because he's talking to us. The DM's talking to us, saying this really mellow stoner talk. Like, you know the word rural is really hard to say? Rural. And we're like... And so, the DM starts rolling dice. And I'm like... What's going on? Because he keeps just he, just... he's just droning on and on about how cool things are and we should just mellow out. And he starts looking, he like looks at one of us and he rolls dice and he looks down and he's like, mm hmm And he looks at me and he rolls dice and he goes, mm-hmm. And I'm like, all of a sudden I start thinking, oh my god, this dude, he's fucking with us. Worse yet, he's casting some kind of spell on us. Like he's trying to hypnotize us because he's looking right in my eyes and he's droning. And so I'm like... I leap up, I leap up, I, I, I slam my hands on the table and I leap up and I go, COUNTER SONG! FUCKING COUNTER SONG! And everyone at the table looks at me and they go, what the fuck is counter song? And I'm just like, I, start, I jumped up and I started singing. I started singing at the table. I started singing Iron Maiden actually. Like, I, I started singing Fear of the Dark. And everyone's looking at me like, and I'm like, I'm singing, a, I'm, I'm singing a ballad right now. I'm singing it loud, and I'm drowning out this fucking caterpillar fucker counter song. So if you don't know what counter song is, it's a little-known bard rule that is almost never exercised because it almost never comes up. What counter song is is that at least in AD and D, bards are gifted with the unique ability of counter song, which allows you to counter 
any musical based or sonic or uh, any kind of sonic attack that is meant to uh, fascinate or enchant or in any way deceive you. But it almost never comes up because nobody attacks you with music or sound or tries to hypnotize you with it, it, like it never comes up ever. So all of, and, and I was like I never used counter song in all my life, but like out of a bolt of fucking lightning, this idea hits me that oh my god, this guy is actually trying to beat us by like enchanting us with his voice. So I start singing, and the DM starts looking through his notes, and he's like. It doesn't say that you can stop this, but that makes a lot of sense what you're doing. And I'm like, what's he doing? He's like, he is actually trying to, he's trying to dominate your minds with the droning of his voice. And thanks to you, you have just saved the entire party. Because after listening to the caterpillar drone on for X number of rounds, he actually forcibly converts every character's alignment to true neutral. <laughs> I, I think you get a save, because he was rolling dice. But yeah, he, he, he converts everyone's alignment to true neutral and convinces them to go smoke his hookah and never leave. And I'm like, this diabolical motherfucker. And I was like, I was horrified by this. I was like, he just tried to change our alignments? What a fucker! So like, Everyone's looking at me like I'm out of my fucking mind. I'm going like, fear off, you know. So, um, and so they're like, what are you doing? And I start singing, he's trying to enchant us. He's trying to enchant us. Fucking kill him. And they go, he is? And I'm like, I pull out my fucking crossbow and I shoot this caterpillar motherfucker in the face. And from then, it's on. Because this caterpillar, like, unfolds his fucking legs. He jumps down off his fucking flower. And he starts fucking attacking us with the rage of a fucking beast. So, that really opened everyone's eyes. It's like, we gotta be fucking careful. Because this shit in Wonderland is fucking diabolical. Like, they were not ex Nobody was expecting that. Because that's sick. That, in an adventure... That's enough to make characters... If he, if he had forcibly converted our characters to true neutral, we would have rioted. Because there's no coming back from that. Like, that's fucking hardcore D&D &D shit right there. That's an end-of-a-character type shit. So, like, I fucking... I'd never used Countersong before. I was so fucking brilliant at that moment. It's probably one of the best D&D &D moments I've ever had in my life, was Countersonging that motherfucker... I've never done it again, by the way. But um, here's where things started to go downhill. Was um, my character was the only magical talent in the party. And that's a problem. When the bard is the reigning authority on all things arcane, and the bard in question is Tandem the Spoonie, that's a bad thing. Because my character had a fair amount of intelligence, but he's Tandem the Spoonie. And he doesn't really know a whole lot about magic. He just kind of takes scrolls and then copies them because they have cool sounding names and then casts them. So, like, people would bring him stuff and they'd be like, can you identify this? And so they'd be give him a sword and my guy would be like, oh, well, oh, it's, it's a... So I'd roll my bardic lore, and sometimes that would be successful, oftentimes not. So I'd be like, it's a blade of sharpness. And they'd be like, really? I'd be like, oh yeah. Yeah, I, I figured you got like a plus three on this bitch right here. And I, <laughs> but, you know, I could read, the, if there was words written engraved on the sword, I'd be like, that. Yeah, this is the blade of Elfandaril. You should have a, just, just yell Elfandaril before you run into a fight, and it, it, it'll be good. <laughs> so, like... My character is completely just half-assing it in terms of the magical tab. We had no wizard. My guy was the only spellcaster, aside from the cleric, of course. So, um, the next stop was the tea party. So, our characters wa wander through the woods, and we're, we're looking for some way out of here. We're stuck in Wonderland, and we come across the tea party. And we're actually really excited, because, you know, we love the tea party. The Mad Hatter's there, the Dormouse, all this shit. And... Uh, the Mad Hatter, Mad Hatter greets us, 
And he's like, oh, come, come and join our tea party. Come and join us. And so we're like, right on. So we, we, we sit down. We're, we're jabbing with the fucking Mad Hatter. And um, he's, he's giving us his weird spiel about unbirthdays and stuff like that. And he's, he's fucking crazy. But we're drinking the tea. We're drinking the Kool-Aid. We shouldn't have drank the tea because God knows what was in it. But um, the, the DM was actually kind of un, not expecting us to be chumming it up with the Mad Hatter. Because he's kind of nutso. And so, um, at some point, he's like, he's like, oh, um, since you're all having a wonderful time at the tea party, well, it seems you're not in the proper costume. And we go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you see the Dormouse has a hat. The other people around this table all are wearing hats. Would you like a hat as well? And we go, no. He goes, oh, but you must have a hat. Here, take some hats. And he starts fucking throwing hats at us as weapons. He's like, roll initiative, guys. And we're like, um, okay. So my character, um, he, he he's he got a good AC, so he misses with the hat. The second guy, our fighter, gets a hat thrown on him, and he's, he's like, uh, enchanted. He's dominated. And so he starts fighting on the Mad Hatter's side. So we're like, oh, shit. This is on now. So... The, uh, the cleric starts knocking that, starts like attacking the hat on the fighter's head. And so the Mad Hatter like fucking draws a sword or some shit and he starts wading into combat with us. And this guy is fucking badass. This Mad Hatter is no push. I mean, this guy was fudding whackering all over us, man. This Mad Hatter, who's not fucking around? Like, at all. So, um, the Mad Hatter and all the Tea Party guys start jumping us, like hardcore jumping us. They're beating our asses. And so, they, um, my character's not the best fighter, like I said. He's kind of a jack-of-all-trades, but he's not exactly a frontline type guy. He has a sword of speed. He, he had a sword of speed, and um, what other weapon did he have? It was a... Uh, he had a Bekta Corban, an unenchanted Bekta Corban, because he liked, <laughs> he liked the hammer on it. it was, he liked having a polearm, and he's like, I want a no, polearm. So he had, a, he had a sword of swiftness, that's what it was. So... Um, the other guys start sussing at targets, because there's basically one for each of us. So the Mad Hatter's engaging the fighter and the cleric. The other guys at the tea party. I can't remember the other guys at the tea party. And I go, I got the Dormouse. <laughs> That's Oreo. And so I, I point over at the Dormouse, because the Dormouse, like, leaps up on the table and starts cracking his knuckles. And I'm like, oh... He, he, like, he, like, the Dormouse, like, points at me, and I point at him, and I'm like, oh, you want some of this, you rat motherfucker? And the, the Dormouse is like, mm -hmm. Um, those of you who have read Dungeon Land are laughing right now. So, me and, I jump up on the table, because I'm a swashbuckler, I draw my sword of swiftness out, and I jump up on the table, and I'm like, ha-ha! Today you, you, today you cross blades with Tandem the Spoonie! Unfortunately, you don't have a blade! And so, this fucking guy... The Dormouse, he rolls initiative and beats me. And then he proceeds to fucking crane kick me 30 feet backwards for about half my hit points and damage. And the DM starts laughing at me. And I'm like, what? He goes, you just picked a fight with the best fighter at the tea party. I go, what? He goes, yeah, the Dormouse? He's a 20th level monk. Oh my god! If you've ever seen what a monk is capable of at high levels, he basically has the touch of death. He like he has the five point palm exploding five point exploding heart technique. That's what the twentieth level monk has. They have like their bodies are so hard they're made of diamond essentially. Like they have like they're essentially immortal. The fucking dormouse, twentieth level monk. I am not even shitting you. So all of a sudden, Tandem the Spoonie is in the fight of his life against the fucking Dormouse. <laughs> it was like a kung fu battle for the ages because everyone's fighting the Mad Hatter, and the Mad Hatter's like a sorcerer. He's not all that badass. The, you know, the other party guests are, are pretty fierce. The Mad Hatter's pretty badass, but I'm, I am... <laughs> I am in a fucking war with the Dormouse. And believe it or not... In a straight-up fight, I won. My 18th-level bard beat a 20th-level monk 
in a fair fight. That, my friends, is badass. That should not happen. But the dice, the dice were on my side. I used my spells brilliantly. I hit when I needed to hit. And I beat that Dormouse motherfucker's ass. We beat the Mad Hatter. And we all came out of it alive. We fucking wrecked that tea party. But from that moment on, we were done. We looked at each other. My character was within like three hit points of dying. I got like a broken arm. This fucking... I got hit with the five point palm exploding heart technique. And I saved against death. And I survived. I'm like grabbing my heart. I got my nose broken. My arm is at my side. And like, I start... I, I, as soon as I dropped that Dormouse, I fucking like rained blows on it to make sure he was fucking dead. I cut that motherfucker into quivering cubes of jelly. <laughs> so I'm like, you stupid Dormouse. You stupid fucker Dormouse. They had to pull me off his quivering carcass. And we look at each other. The entire tea party is a smoldering fucking ruin because I was throwing fireballs. I was throwing all. I was throwing lightning bolts. All sorts of shit. And you can't have the squeaky toy. It's distracting. Um, I'm this. It's a war zone. The party. We all look at each other and we agree. From that moment on, we're fucking done with Wonderland. This place sucks. We agreed from that moment on, whatever we saw, we was going to kill it. We, were, we weren't going to do this Wonderland whimsical shit. We weren't going to go walk up to the friendly caterpillars. We weren't going to walk up to the fucking Cheshire Cat. We weren't going to negotiate with the Queen of Hearts. No more of this shit. No. Oreo, no. No more of this shit. It's a war. So, so like, we would burst through the woods, and the DM would be like, you encounter a clearing and you hear a you hear a melodic chuckling and all of a sudden you see smiling teeth appear in the distance just underneath a set of cat's eyes. Welcome, the Cheshire Cat says, and we're like, you could stop right there. We're fucking killing it. And he's like, but but it has like a speed. He's like, but it has a spiel. He wants to talk to you, and we're like, yeah, no, no, we're we're shooting it a lot. And sure enough, the Cheshire Cat was going to attack us anyway. So, the Queen of Hearts, we just stormed the Queen of Hearts' garden and just killed everybody. We weren't having this shit anymore. So, we, we basically just were on this rampage through fucking Wonderland. We left nothing alive. Nobody got out of that shit alive. Yeah, um, we really went thug. We thugged out on that adventure. We just... After that fucking tea party, we went in there with like whimsical intentions. We were like, we're gonna have, we're gonna let Wonderland take us away and enchant us, and we're gonna have some fun talking to the characters of Wonderland. Yeah, fuck that, because <laughs> those guys, everything in Wonderland wants you dead. Everything. The Queen of Hearts, off with her head. Yeah, she's she's one of the more straightforward guys in that adventure. We were just like, no, no, fuck it. Queen of Hearts is dead. So, um. And it's a meat grinder. I mean, these characters were fucking dangerous. I forget what the Cheshire Cat was, but the Cheshire Cat was no pushover neither. Because it kind of, like, evolved into some hulking brute form. And that was no fun either. So, we brawl our way through Dungeon Land, and we're going through Land Beyond the Magic Mirror. And we finally reach the end. And the end boss of Wonderland... We're, we're, we're trying to find a portal out of, out of Wonderland. And we don't find a portal per se, so much as we find a ship. And we're like, we know, every, the, the guy, we t the, we're told that there's a portal out of here, we go to where the portal is and there's a ship there. It's like a pirate ship or something like that, but it's, it's, on, the, it's on the ground. And so we board the ship and we have another fight. And it's the worst fight yet. It's, it's a fucking hellacious fight. And there's like this... I forget all the monsters that are there, but it really it really came down to like three guys that were kind of on this ship. There was it was like the captain, his first mate, and his wizard. And so the captain and the first I I I can't remember the details of the fight too much, but really what I was focused on was the wizard because being the 
being the ad hoc wizardly wizardry ad hoc wizardry talent of the party, of course they were squaring me up with the wizard. So I was on wizard detail trying to counterspell this motherfucker. But what the DM told me was, he goes, yeah, um, you're fighting this jester, and as soon as the fight starts, you see the the flesh melt off the jester's face, to where you see that he is merely a skeleton wearing harlequin clothes and there's a skull with glowing blue eyes beneath. You, thanks to your bardic lore, you deduce that the jester is in fact a lich. So I'm like, oh fuck. What is, ugh. I'm like, oh fuck. First the level 20 fucking dormouse monk and now a lich? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I go, I hate you. So we start fighting and the fight immediately goes very poorly for us. Um, the, the first thing the Lich does is cast, I believe it's an 8th eighth or, eighth or ninth level spell, it's one of the highest spells in the game, called Prismatic Spray. And we all get fucking bushwhacked with this Prismatic Spray. And so, I make my save, I, four of us make our saves. One of us, our best fighter, is hit with, I think it's the Green Ray, and the green ray turns him to stone. Fails a save, he's gone. The second guy gets hit with the death aspect of it, fails a save, he's dead. Right off the bat, we lose two characters. So now we're four out, we're, we're, at the final, we're at the final fight and we're two characters down, just irretrievably down. I don't have any way to restore the stone guy at all. So it really was one of the most like epic fights I've ever done because I was basically crossing swords with a fucking lich. And we won. There were two of us left. It was me and the cleric. <laughs> Are you crying, Oreo? Come here. Come here. It was me and the cleric who were the only ones left. Our ranger died. Our fighter died. Our thief died. And who else died? Uh, we had we had, we had a ranger. It was it was like it was like two fighter whatever. But it was me and the cleric who were the only ones left. And we won. I don't know how we won. But that was, that was a fight. Uh, so the DM's like, uh, well, um, there's no other crew on the ship, and you, you have killed the captain, so the ship is yours. And I go, great, the ship is ours, but it's on the land. He goes, well, yeah, but if you go looking in the, you, you go looking in the captain's cabin and you discover the captain's log that this is a spelljammer ship. And I'm like, I'm not too familiar with spelljammer, but... He's like, oh, it's okay. You, you can read the captain's log, and it's fairly straightforward. This is a ship that flies between worlds. It can actually lift off and take you. So, like, this is your escape. This is how you're going to get away from, from Dungeonland. You're actually going to physically sail off and follow the charts back to your home. And so I go, wow, okay, okay. That's pretty cool. But who says I want to go home? He's like, the DM goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, if this is our, this is our final voyage... What do you say we follow, like, I, I talked to the cleric, I'm like, what do you say we follow these charts and just, you know, second star on the right straight out until morning, and the cleric's, the cleric's like, yeah, yeah, uh, well, we should probably take the bodies back to their home world and see if we can get them raised. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, but after that we'll go sailing. And he's like, yeah, okay. So that was the last ride of Tandem the Spoonie where I went back and I got my friends raised, or unstoned, as it were, and we fucking killed everything in Dungeon Land, and then we sailed off into the stars, and that's, I couldn't think of a better way for the character to uh, officially retire. Um, and it really was one of the greatest series of victories I've ever had in a series of role-playing games, because the DM did not let us win. He, he pulled no punches, he fucking threw a 20th level monk at us, he fucking threw a lich at us, and he threw the fucking lich's minions, and uh, he killed almost all of us. But uh, we had no backup, we had no lifeline... Uh, we pretty much all died, and I won't lie, it came down to a lot of luck. Uh, but, you know what? Sometimes, that's how, uh, that's how fights go, is it comes down to a lot of luck. I would, I would not want to play that kind of adventure again, just because, uh, 99 times out of 100, we would have lost that one. But, this time we won, and, uh, it, it was because of teamwork, and it was because, uh, we played our characters well, and uh, we made some good decisions, and things worked out. So, uh, yeah, that was... A, and it was a good way for Tandem, who was a... By the end of Dungeonland, he was pretty shell-shocked. 
and he was pretty much ready to retire from the adventuring biz. So, uh, so he had a ship, and he was going to go exploring other worlds because he'd seen everything there was to see on uh, on Greyhawk. So he was going to go he was going to go cruising other worlds, and so that, I think that was the really that, that was a, it was a good way to do it. And actually, it's a way for him to come back one day if he ever feels like coming back. If I ever run a D&D game and I felt like bringing him back, I can bring him back as first level. You know, you can always assume that, you know, uh, he, you know he used to be a demigod or he could have been a demigod again or, you know, whatever. You can, you can kind of justify anything to... to <laughs> you can do anything to justify the loss of levels or whatever. You know, he could come back one day and, and do an adventure. I don't think I'd ever want to, but um, if the right adventure came along, I could see it happening. You know, he, eventually he finds a new world, he settles down, and he's kind of the world... He's kind of the worldly guy who's been everywhere, kind of a legendary figure, very infamous. But yeah, that was Dungeon Land and how we killed everything in it. That was the, that's the story. Bye.